Welcome everyone to this uh, session on improving tax collection, which is a very important topic, as we all know. And I'm pleased to say I see so many people here. Uh, improving tax collection has become even more important, I would believe, to say, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we need to increase tax collection to uh, reach the sustainable development goals. So that's pretty much the point of departure for this uh, session. My name is uh, Simon Bjørnru. I work with the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation. Uh, we support the Univider Domestic Research Mobilization Program. The aim of this program is to help improve developing countries' uh, tax system and to strengthen developing countries uh, domestic capacities to increase uh, revenue collection please go to the univider website to check it out improving tax collection is both about policy and administration it's about changing the rules and better enforce the ones that already exist both are equally important Today, we will mostly focus on enforcement, including how this could be improved by better utilizing automation and technology. We have three distinguished presenters with us to shed some light on this topic. They will present their papers 10 minutes each uh, and before we open for questions towards the end. You can ask your questions in the Q&A or uh, you can also take the mic to ask uh, the questions yourself. First, I will ask Ronald Weisva uh, to come on stage to present uh, the highlights of his paper. Ronald will talk about the potential that lies in simple tax regimes, tax administration innovation and education programs. Ronald Weisva is a supervisor for research and policy analysis at Uganda Revenue Authority. He collaborated with ICTT, ICTD on several research projects in Uganda and Ethiopia on issues including taxing, wealthy individuals, public sector agencies, and, and improving tax compliance. He has also collaborated with Univider on research projects including tax compliance uh, of presumptive taxpayers and tax benefit micro simulation modeling. So please, Ronald. Yeah, so thank you, Simon. Uh, because of time, I'll go still uh, straight into the presentation. One, it's been a collaborative um, study between myself, uh, Maria from New Wider, and my friend here, Mile, uh, who is the SCRPD. And here we, uh, we try to assess the effectiveness of two administrative interventions that are targeted at improving tax compliance of small businesses um, in Uganda. So um, in terms of motivation, um, in developing countries largely, um, there is a large informal sector. And because of weak institutions and low social norms of paying taxes, there is a challenge to mobilize domestic revenue, um, the domestic revenue resources, which are needed to support development and be less dependent on aid. So um, for most of the African countries that have established presumptive regimes, for small businesses, which are commonly known as presumptive tax. Now, presumptive tax is a tax on, on turnover. So there are no allowable deductions. So you, you just declare the turnover and they take a percentage of that tax to the, the percentage on the turnover. Now, we have administrative interventions that URA has implemented over time uh, that we assess in this project. And in this study, we assess how effective they have been in terms of increasing the tax base and in terms of increasing uh, revenue corrections. We have three questions we answer here. So one is how has the new simpler e filing system been effective in increasing the number of taxpayers and how effective has been the taxpayer register expansion project codenamed TRIP in increasing the number of taxpayers. So we established the effect of these two administrative interventions, the new e simpler filing, and then the taxpayer register on the number of taxpayers uh, registered. And then two, 
we try to assess how these reforms have impacted the revenue. And for TREP, we assess how effective, cost effective it has been. Now, the trend of taxpayers, presumptive taxpayers over time, this is how it has taken. You, for instance, see that from 2011, it is increasing marginally, and then we see a sharp increase from 2015 to 16. So we try to assess what are the implications of TREP and what are the implications of, um, of e fighting on this jump. So briefly about TREP, TREP is um, a collaborative project between Uganda Revenue Authority, local government agencies, and the registration bureau for, for companies. They work in collaboration to reach out to the bigger business community, mainly the small traders. So they register companies in a collaborative environment. Then the new e filing system is, is, is web-based. Now, originally, they were filing the normal traditional income tax return, which is complicated and based on Excel templates. Now, in July 2015, at the URA, Uganda Revenue Authority, rolled out a simpler return form, which is web-based for presumptive taxpayers. So what the presumptive taxpayers are required to do is to just specify their tax identification number, to specify their location and turnover, and then the system automatically computes the tax for them. Then in terms of the data and methods, we use tax administrative data from here at Uganda Revenue Authority, returns for presumptive from 2012 to 2012 13 to 2017-18. And we also use returns for corporate income tax, uh, especially uh, returns for, for taxpayers under corporate income tax in the range of 150 and 400 million, equally small taxpayers for comparison purposes. And then we use simple impact evaluation methods to analyze both the impact of TREP and new filing separately using the difference and difference uh, approach. Then in TREP, we consider both treatment and control are presumptive taxpayers. So because TREP was implemented in, in phases, so for instance, it started in Kampara, which is the capital city of Uganda. So the control for that are taxpayers that, that were outside Kampala. So both the treatment and control groups are presumptive taxpayers. But now when we come to e-filing, the treatment group is the presumptive taxpayers, and the control group are corporate income taxpayers that are equally small, just above the presumptive threshold of 150 million Uganda shillings to 400, to 400 million. So in terms of our main findings, um, we see here the impact of TREP on the left, uh, and we see um, where we see TREP1, TREP1, TREP 2 and TREP 3, TREP 1 is because TREP was first rolled out in uh, Kampala, which is the capital city of Uganda. And then after the first year, it was rolled out to other bigger uh, towns in Uganda. And then TREP 3 is when it was rolled out to other smaller, smaller municipalities across the country. And now in terms of um, the impact of TREP on the number of taxpayers, as you can see TREP 1 in Kampala, it had a significant impact on the number of taxpayers that were newly registered. But then when we split the after TREP period, um, because in terms of methodology, we had TREP implemented, but there were different methods that the project was, implement, was using. We had the one-stop border posts. So the one-stop border posts is where services could be got from one point. So URA and the collaborating institution set up an office where all the services could be picked from one point in time. So we see that uh, where you see trip, three, trip one after, in, in column three, for instance, we see that the one-stop border posts, when the collaborating institution set up a, an office where all the services were provided in one point, it had a significant impact, a significant impact on the number of taxpayers. So it was a better method to implement, to, to increase the taxpayer size. And that is also observed in uh, trip two, when it was rolled out to other municipalities, it did have a positive impact on number of taxpayers. And again, we see that when the one-stop border posts in column six, when the one-stop border posts were implemented in these three municipalities, the impact was still much stronger. Now in TREP three, the one-stop border post was implemented at the same time when TREP was rolled out to those municipalities. And that's why we have one column here, which is seven. And we still find, found a significant impact of TREP on the number of taxpayers. So in terms of expanding the taxpayer base, TREP had a significant impact, and especially the one-stop border office, one-stop border post. Then in terms of 
new e filing uh, you remember the control group here is corporate income taxpayers that were filing the traditional income tax return um, so here we find it having a positive impact also significant impact on the number of taxpayers and uh, we see this even after so that is it in terms of number of taxpayers then when we check out the two interventions we find that the the, the effects of the intervention interventions are complementary so trap and the new e filing system came into effect around the same time so possibly complementary effect because reforms impacted the same group of taxpayers on trap's objective was to educate one of trap's objective was to educate taxpayers not only to formalize them so maybe it also had um, implications on e filing so So we then try to understand who are these taxpayers that were actually brought on board. So we see that while most of them, most of the new, we got a big number of new registered taxpayers, most of them were very small. And you can see here, they were bunching at almost the first threshold. It's the threshold here runs from 10 million to 50 million. That is the first threshold. And we see most of them were bunching. So we did not register really significant or high value taxpayers unfortunately then in terms of revenue the results are here uh trip one trip two and trip three like i discussed um before we still see an impact of, on tax payables of trip and again we do the, see the same impact when we, we put in the the one-stop center office one-stop center office is where i said all the, the, the collaborating institutions set up one office and where all the services were implemented in the same place. You, you could go in one office, you register your business with the Uganda Registration Service Bureau, you get a trading license from the local government, and then you pay the URA taxes in one office. So we still see it having a significant impact here, even in these municipalities where there is trip two, and then where there is trip three. So same applies to e fighting We find it having a significant impact or on the tax payable. Then in terms of analyzing the cost benefit analysis of TREP, here we use simplified back of the envelope calculations. We calculate the average additional tax revenue per industry by area per year from TREP one and three. And then we have, we compare this with the URS budget for TREP and calculate the average expenditure per industry per area per year. So we see that on average, the additional revenue was approximately 14 million and the average expense on TRIP was roughly 1.5 million. So therefore, we find that TRIP was actually cost effective. So in terms of conclusion, both TRIP and the new e filing system increased the number of taxpayers and the tax revenues. Two is that the interventions, however, complemented each other. And the largest effect was after the establishment of one-stop shops in TREP. We find that the benefits outweigh costs in terms of um, costs. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ronald. Perfect timing, 10 minutes sharp. So that was very interesting. And um, next, uh, I will ask uh, Amina Ibrahim <clears throat> to take the virtual stage. Her study discusses how administrative uh, interventions help lower the extent of tax avoidance and evasion. At the same time, uh, it says something about whether technical assistance financed by donor countries has an impact. And evaluations like that are rare to come by. Amina is an economist holding a PhD from uh, University of Cape Town. She's a research associate at uh, the Univider, where she's a core researcher in the domestic resource mobilization program. Her research includes uh, labor and public e economics. Her work focuses on making large administrative tax data available for research and research collaboration with African revenue authorities. So Amina, please. Thank you, Simon, um, and uh, thank you, Ronald, as well, for your presentation. I'll actually make some references to it here as well. Um, to just double check, you can see my slides? Yes. Great. OK. Um, so today, I'll be sharing some highlights from a study, and maybe one of the first studies uh, of more to come uh, on 
in Tanzania, and this one specifically is on tax examinations. The study was conducted in collaboration with colleagues at the Tanzanian Revenue Authority and the University of Dar es Salaam. But in addition to the the co or the collaborators mentioned here, they you know we are grateful to colleagues uh, at the TRA in assisting us with the data extraction and some of the data work, uh, and for those at the Finnish Tax Authority. So. In terms of the context for for this presentation and the study is what we think is the core focus of any tax administration is broadly twofold, uh, expanding the tax base, sort of what Ronald's not been talking to us about, and then enhancing tax compliance while at the same time minimizing tax evasion. I think Ludwig's gonna talk about that next, um, but also to maximize the revenue collection. Now, to further this aim, tax authorities have increasingly been using technology as a powerful tool. Um, and in this case, we're going to talk about technology as a, risk, as a tool for risk assessment by revenue authorities. So this pilot introduces a risk-based non-audit approach for identifying, tax, for identifying which taxpayers to examine. So the <clears throat> the pilot study was a collaboration between the Finnish Tax Authority, Vero, with the Tanzanian Revenue Authority, and this is part of a broader technical assistance program. So we're presenting to you some evaluation of the pilot study, but there are other efforts uh, of that collaboration. How does the pilot work? The pilot introduced an Excel sheet uh, to be used at tax offices in the Dar es Salaam region that flags taxpayers for an examination based on a risk assessment. So you have a tax officer who enters information based on the tax form uh, into this Excel sheet, and at the end of it, it says this pay, whether or not the taxpayer needs to be uh, flagged for an assessment. The pilot was introduced in July 2019, and it was only introduced in the Dar es Salaam region. And it was designed to test the effectiveness of risk-based non-audit control measures. The goal of this research study is to examine the impact of the treatment or the pilot on the incremental tax revenues uh, for, for, from firms subject to this examination. And what we'll show today is that there's, there has been an increase in adjusted taxable income collected. So interestingly, it's my the how do we calculate this effect? It's actually very similar to what um, Ronald's just shared with us. It's also a difference in difference approach, um, and quite similar in the sense of some of the areas that we've implemented, how the pilot was implemented. Uh, to take you through this, so we use a difference in difference model to estimate the impact of tax examinations on revenue. And what this method does, it compares the change in adjusted revenue between the before and after implementation of the project in the pilot area, which is our now Dar es Salaam region, and, and areas that were not uh, run in the pilot, so outside of the Dar es Salaam region. Um, and so this method is commonly used and provides reliable evidence about the impacts of certain, if certain key assumptions hold. The idea, the simple idea behind it is that in the absence of the policy, the revenues in both areas would evolve in the same way. Um, and so for those who are interested in the equation, the DAR, let's see, if you can see this, so the DAR region is, um, that's our treatment variable, post is our time variable, and the interaction between our treatment and our time is what we're interested in, so we're interested in this coefficient um, delta. We use data, um, administrative firm level panel data that's collected by the Tanzanian Revenue Authority. Um, so this is data that contains about 25,000 observations each year, and this is for the period 1st of July 2015 to the end of June 2020. Uh, and the, date, the data includes uh, information both in the region we're interested in, in Dar es Salaam, but also includes areas around that. Um, and 
I, I guess the interesting thing to note here, and I'll bring it up a bit later again, is that we have data now on one year, this one year period uh, of implementation of this pilot study. So what we do in the first instance is inspect the, the trends in the adjusted taxable income um, between the two groups. So what we check is the, the treatment group here is firms in the Dar es Salaam region, and that's represented by the solid line. And then in the control region, so that's outside of Dar es Salaam, and that's your dotted line. And then this period before the implementation of the pilot, we we understand that this is um, mostly parallel, and, and so what we're looking for is if there's any difference um, in the period after, and it looks like there is some divergence there, so we have some indication of what we think might happen. So what do we find? Um, we don't find any increase in the number of examinations. Uh, so the, the pilot hasn't actually flagged a lot more uh, firms than they previously would have. Uh, but we do find that the pilot led to a statistically significant increase in additional reported income. And we look at various ways. So we look at the taxable income, we look at the adjusted uh, income, and then we look at some extra income. And then depending on the model, we we see basically a, between a 10 and 15 percent uh, percentage increase depending on the modeling strategy. Um, when we try and control for um, the type of firm or the firm in the industry, um, and then even if we cl cluster our standard errors um, at the firm level, our results remain the same, quite similar. Uh, and we also find that while this was implemented both for corporate income tax um, and in personal income tax, the effects mainly driven by adjusted corporate income tax. And the impact is arising predominantly from the service sector. So where does this leave us? Well, we've been able to show that the pilot uh, led to an increase in reported income. The study was only conducted in the first year that the pilot was available. So we don't know how long this effect will last um, and how implementation continues. Uh, are tax offices continuing with this? How, how do they find using it? And, and I think that would be an important question going forward. Um, However, at the, at the moment, the TRA are in investigating implementation in other regions, um, but the, the implementation might change because there's also been a change in the, the way in which uh, corporate income taxpayers file their taxes, and so they've started moving towards e-filing. And this may, again, bring about this um, push towards using ICT uh, for these risk-based examinations, so you'll have something that's somewhat more automated instead of an Excel sheet um, where, you know, you have to manually input all the information. But the main message here is that there is potential for cost-effective enforcement improvements that can be devised using tax data in a novel way. And this is even in a low-income setting uh, and potentially very important as part of a plan to improve tax collection and move uh, towards this post-pandemic period. Um, so this research is not yet available online, but it should be within the next month or so, and we're hoping to publish this alongside a research brief. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amina. It's very, very interesting. Um, so, um, and then let's go to the last one. Uh, Ludwig Weir, um, he has written several papers on tax avoidance and evasion. Uh, has among several things shown the potential that lies in digital tax enforcement. So Ludwig is a postdoctoral researcher from um, Berkeley and holds a PhD from the University of Copenhagen. His research and teaching focuses on international taxation inequality and development. In that context, he is also working as a consultant to the Univider IMF and the National Treasury in South Africa. He has previously worked as a public sector government management uh, consultant in Boston Consulting Group and as an assistant economist uh, at the Danish Ministry of F 
finance. So please, Ludwig. Hi there. My name is Ludwig Weir, and today I'm going to be speaking about my practical insights from IMF and UN missions on how to use advanced analytics in tax enforcement. Now, the basis of my talk today will be uh, the experiences uh, from uh, my missions in, in five different African countries with the IMF and the UN, where we promoted the use of advanced uh, analytics to improve enforcement both in domestic taxes and in customs. The overall lesson from, from all of these missions, in my view, is that advanced analytics can be easily implemented and that big data is already there, it's already available to the tax authorities in uh, all of the countries I've seen, uh, and it just needs to be used. Now, uh, we went into all of these missions with the target of improving compliance, uh, taxpayer compliance, while keeping the amount of resources constant, right? And uh, the circle, of course, that we're trying to square here is that there are lots of tax cheaters out there, but there's only uh, limited resources in a tax authority. So we want to make sure that the, the audits we do, they really count. And how are audits then currently being done in 99.9% .9 of all tax authorities? Well, right now, uh, the way it works is that uh, each tax authority sits down and designs uh, a set of taxpayer risk rules manually. Uh, so a common risk rule can, for example, be that you compute the taxes paid as a ratio to gross sales for each individual business. Now, if that ratio looks far off, there are much less taxes being paid uh, as a ratio of, of gross sales than in comparable businesses, well, then you assign a certain risk score to that firm. And you can do the same using other ratios or looking at the ratios of taxes paid this year compared to last year, etc. The key point here is that all of these rules are created by human beings manually uh, based on intuition. And at the end of the day, you then uh, assign these, these, these risk scores to, to all of the taxpayers and you audit X percent of the returns based on your resource. Now, this is the status quo. Where we want to go is to a situation where all of these taxpayer risk rules and risk scores, they are not manually recorded by human beings. They are instead designed automatically using all available data. And one way to do that is, for example, to use a machine learning algorithm or other fully data-driven algorithms where you simply tell the computer, we want to maximize the return uh, on, on our limited amounts of, of audits and, and examinations or other interventions. And please, computer, go and, and find a way for us to do that. Um, we don't need exactly to understand why, we just want this equation to be maximized. That is the utopia where we have to go. Now, the benefits of automated data-driven case selection are fairly obvious, but, but let me still go through them. So first of all, we're sure that, that all available data is used, not only what we as human beings can grasp. And uh, equally important, we ensure that the variables of interest uh, from this enormous uh, set of data that is available to a tax authority, the variables of interest are chosen by uh, an automated model, uh, not a human being meaning that we allow the algorithm to see patterns that human beings cannot grasp. So I gave the example before with the ratio of taxes paid to gross sales. That's a meaningful statistic to me. Uh, but of course, uh, we, we want to ensure that, that all of the most important relationships and all of the most important variables, they are weeded through a computer looking for all possible patterns. Now, another benefit 
of moving to automated data-driven case selection is that you can continuously and in real time update your risk assessment. You are not uh, restricted to waiting for a tax auditor to have time to sit and update the risk rules. The computer can do it all the time. And finally, I think uh, a benefit of, of having automated data-driven case selection is that firms and citizens know that all of their transactions are constantly being watched and evaluated, not only in a case where, um, where an auditor has the time to audit you, which is uh, very rarely in the real world. Now, I've sketched out here how the process of moving to data-driven audit selection looks like, and, it, and it's fairly simple. So on the left, uh, we start by importing and merging all the data sets that we can find. So we start with the tax returns. So in all the countries I've seen, that's gonna be in a digitized format. So we have that already. There's gonna to be tons of useful information on that. But we can merge that with the customs data, which is almost always also digitized. The bill of lading information is extremely useful. So we merge that with the tax return data using the taxpayer identification number. Then we go and look for, for more fringe data sets. So that can, for example, be a registry of uh, land titles or water usage, etc. Whatever we can find, we take that and merge it into the other data. And once we've done that, which is the biggest assignment, we go ahead and transform the data. So that means doing tabulation, summing over years or whatever we think is, is, is useful. And it could also mean uh, computing networks, networks amongst uh, taxpayers, which previous research has found to be a, a meaningful uh, statistic when looking for tax uh, cheaters. Uh, and once we've done that, imported the data, merged the data, transformed the data, well, then we've really done 99% of the work. So actually going from that to building a predictive model that uh, predicts the likelihood and the consequence of, of uh, auditing uh, a taxpayer, that's, that's going to be uh, a matter of minutes. And there, that's a situation where uh, when we go on these missions, we've actually built the code for, for, for doing the, the predictive modeling. We've built it from home. So this, this literally takes a matter of, of hours to set up. And once we have the predictive model, uh, done and running, we're going to have a list of taxpayers uh, that have a high risk and high uh, consequence. So, so taxpayers that, that we want to go and audit. Uh, and we put the model into use and we keep an open eye uh, towards whether the model was right or wrong. And when it, whatever the answer is, we go back and tell the model such that it can improve the algorithm and we get this continuous loop of uh, deployment and, and learning. In 2016, the OECD did a report on uh, looking into the implementation of advanced analytics in, in rich countries. And, and they found that the number one reason for advanced analytics not being utilized in revenue authorities in rich countries was first and foremost a lack of trust in the algorithms producing correct results. Now, the obvious solution to this is, of course, to go ahead and do rigorous impact measurement. The OECD also found that the algorithms would often produce non-actionable intel, right? So the solution to this is that you make sure that not only does your algorithm tell you that you're going to go ahead and, and audit this taxpayer, but it also tells you why uh, the algorithm thinks you should go and check this taxpayer, meaning that the auditor actually knows what to look for. And finally, what the OECD found is that there was a broad uh, resistance to change from, from auditors who felt that their skills become redundant 
when an algorithm goes and, and replicate their job, right? And for that uh, to, 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 to change, you, you, you really need to, to go and work with the softer values in, 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 the, in the form of, of change management. And I'm not gonna go into that today. Now, let me just briefly address how you can approach the issue of rigorous impact measurement. So there's the first stage where you do simple statistical uh, testing, right? So you can do all of these well-known uh, methods where you build the model using a training data set and you test it on a separate data set, right? But that's, that's still going to be statistical testing, which is, which is uh, hard for, for non-economists to trust. So what you really want to fairly quickly move to is in-field, real-life policy evaluation where you do uh, an actual RCT, uh, a horse race between uh, the old uh, manual risk modeling versus the new uh, computer algorithm. And uh, one way to do this that, that uh, we have advised countries to do is to, for example, select 300 cases, the best 300 cases that your, your algorithm tells you to, to go ahead and audit and then randomly assign these 300 cases based on the new models to auditors and inspectors. Now, you ensure that the auditor or inspector does not know whether it was the new risk model that was used to, uh, to select who was, was audited or whether it was one of their colleagues. And this allows you in an unbiased way to have a horse race between the new and the old case selection. Now, if the model is successful, it's easy for you to, to upscale it to 500 cases, then 1,000, etc. Now, a lesson that we also try to convey on these missions is that in the long run, we're all dead, right? So we want to aim for rapid pilot implementation, then learn from that and repeat the exercise. The aim here is not perfection, but improvement. And what we try to stress is that each day we make wrong choices in a tax authority. And, and these choices are partly informed by poor or missing modeling. Now, if we can build a model that improves risk targeting compared to current procedures, then we are wasting uh, taxpayer money but by not doing it right now. So we want to deploy our model in small scale, benchmark it with the current alternative, and then if successful, in larger scale. Now I'm very briefly gonna speak to a model uh, that we built for container examinations. In now, what you see here is a completely standard picture of how case selection looks in both rich and poor countries. So you see that for uh, the, on, on the y-axis here, we have the yield of the container examination, the size of the upliftment. Uh, and on the x-axis, you have the, 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 the ranked number of examinations. And we see that very few, only 7% of the container examinations result in a large upliftment, while the bulk 73% of examinations deliver no. Now with predictive modeling, we were able to, uh, to, to change that ratio a lot. So we, we proved in a pilot model that uh, we could do 60% of current upliftment with only 10% of the resources, or we could do 100%, uh, gain 100% of current upliftment with 33% of examinations. So in essence, the model could either be used to facilitate trade by examining way less uh, containers or increase the total amount of upliftments that is to do the same amount of inspections, but with a higher return. And that was all from me. Thank you so much for listening. Well, Thank you very much, all of you. We don't have that much time, but I hope that um, we all learned something about uh, the potential
that lies in uh, automation and uh, technology. Uh, I don't think there's any silver bullet in improving tax collection, but I think uh, to be to be sure that this is uh, ICT is an avenue to pursue. Um, I see that uh, I'm not sure if I get this right, but I think uh, this one question in the chat to Ronald. Ronald, has have you seen the, the, the question? It's a technical question. OK, so fine. Yeah, I saw it. I, I saw it. And um, what I can say is, uh, yes, we did some robustness checks, but uh, mainly they were to deal with checking if our results are consistent. So what we did, we used the different control groups, especially when we're trying to investigate the impacts of e fighting where we investigated that using different control groups, especially uh, people that were in the corporate income tax category, uh, but under uh, within the same threshold of uh, presumptive, 0 to 150. Then we also used another control group of 1, of 1 million to 150. Uh, then zero to 400, and the results were not changing. But also for TREP, we used the number of small, small corporate income taxpayers, and the results were small and also positive. Uh, in terms of the other squared value, I think we need to check it again. That we didn't, but we are going to check again. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Kati, have, have you seen uh, any other questions? Uh where I can't. Uh... There's now one question in the Q&A section from Jukka Pirtila. Can you see that, Simon? Yeah, so uh, in lo uh, so Jukka is asking, in low income countries, a small number of firms are responsible for a large share of revenues. Should all these firms be selected uh, to examination irrespective of what prediction model suggests? So anyone feel uh, like they want to answer this? So, so uh, I think it's a really good point, Yuka, and and I think you'll get to this conclusion maybe quickly if you just do a simple, you know, probability times consequence, right? That if if as you as you note, uh, there are some countries where one firm, you know, even if they they just evade a percentage of their, their total tax bill, then that's going to be more than the entire tail. So in these cases, it makes a lot of sense to order them uh, no matter what. My view. I was asking and thinking that the, the technology you have been talking about today, uh, is it um, a kind of technology that can be employed by like all different countries or is it i mean it, I, I guess it has to be adapted to local conditions uh, and local capabilities uh, but I, i'm not sure if it's is it advanced or is it uh, uh, how is it um so uh, so what we usually do is that we <clears throat> we start by automating what the tax authorities already do uh, and we've we've been to also uh, very poor countries, and there usually you'll have a setup as uh, as Amina was 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 also describing. So the first thing we do is that we we help them automate this process of assigning risk scores based on on manual rules. Uh, and I've yet not seen a place where we couldn't uh, assist in doing that. And and when you've done that, then it's actually a fairly easy step to then use more advanced modeling, right? So whether you do the risk scores manually or you have a computer helping you do them, that's actually the smallest part of, of the uh, equation. So, so, so the short answer is yes, I think uh, using advanced uh, risk modeling can, can be useful for, for all the countries I've at least uh, been to. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And uh, I really enjoyed the presentations, and I um, um, people should uh, also read the papers. I, uh, I think they're out, maybe except uh, Amina's not yet, but we should share them, and uh, and then you can sit in in quiet and uh, and read them.
so uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to join this uh, this session and uh, have a nice day